Good evening. We have some very exciting news this month. Using the great Anglo-Australian telescope at Siding Spring in New South Wales, Paul Hewitt and Stephen Warren have identified the most remote object ever found. It's a quasar, known by its catalogue number of 051279. And there's a photograph of it. This, of course, um, is a negative. And the quasar is that tiny-looking dot on the end of the white arrow. Um, do let me add, the white arrow was put on afterwards. Well, the apparent magnitude is only 20, and therefore you can only see it with extremely large telescopes. But the distance is thought to be something in the region of 12,000 million light years. And it's racing away at 93% of the speed of light. And you know, really, I think we are now getting somewhere to the stage of talking about getting to the edge of the observable universe. So it's a very exciting discovery indeed. And we have more to say about it later on. But coming very much nearer home, what about Bradfield's Comet? Well, it's there, there's a picture of it, and the star above the comet is actually a star called 18 Aquarii, magnitude 5. You can just about see the comet with the naked eye when the moon isn't too obtrusive. It's not spectacular, but it is there. They're not going to show it easily. And it's been tracking up past the bright star, Altair in Aquila, and as you can see, it's going to go on in that direction. It won't, I'm afraid, get any brighter, but it's worth looking at. After all, it is the brightest comet that we've had for some time, and it's quite a good subject also for photography. So now, on to our main topic for this evening. I think everybody can recognize the magnificent constellation of Orion, which now rises in the east at fairly early in the evening. And there's a picture of it taken by Ron Arbor. And I think most people can know the characteristic pattern of bright stars. And there we have Betelgeuse, the red supergiant in the upper left-hand corner, and the brilliant white Rigel to the lower right. Most people, I think, can recognize Orion. But you know, what we call a constellation isn't really made up of connected stars because the stars are at very different distances from us. They are so far away that their individual or proper motions are very slow and uh, to the naked eye, Orion looks much the same now as it must have done way back in the days of Julius Caesar or even earlier. But nevertheless, the stars are not associated and we are dealing only with a line of sight effect. Let me show you what I mean. Here we have another representation of Orion only this is a studio one, recognize the red Betelgeuse, upper left-hand corner. Now we're going to move the camera. We place the stars at the right relative distances from the camera, but as we move the camera around, you can see there's a shift. It's not the stars which are moving, it is the camera. And by the time we've gone round to a different vantage point, we've lost the Orion pattern completely. And in fact, if we were looking at those stars from a different position in the galaxy, then we wouldn't see our familiar Orion at all. On the other hand, although the stars are so far away, uh, they do show very small individual or proper motions, and over a sufficient period of time, these do add up. So let's come now to the second really familiar constellation, Ursa Major, the Great Bear, with the seven stars making up the plough, because those stars are not so far away as those of Orion. There, over to the right, you can see the two pointers, Merak and Dupe, and they show the way to the Pole Star, and over to the far left, the star al -Kade. Now, it so happens that Arcade and the upper pointer, Dupe, are moving in the opposite direction compared with the other five stars. And over a sufficiently long period of time, this does add up. So um, let's get into a time machine and go back for 200,000 years. And that would be the plough pattern. Arcade's still there to the upper left, but as you can see, the pattern has been lost. Now we come on to the present day, and there we have the plough as it is now. And now, let's go forward 200,000 years, and we'll see that the pattern is like that. But, as I say, the stars are so remote that these proper motions are extremely small, we are dealing with fractions of a second of arc. And just to show you how small a second of arc is, well, here I have a two-shilling piece, or a 10p in our modern Mickey Mouse money. And if I hold that up at arm's length, it will more than cover the apparent diameter of the full moon. And to make it cover the apparent diameter of the full moon, I must take that coin out to a distance of 10 feet. But the apparent diameter of the moon is nearly 2,000 seconds of arc. And if I want to take that coin so far away that it will subtend an angle of only one second of arc, then I've got to put it out at a distance of three and three quarter miles. But in astronomy, we are dealing with angles very much smaller than that. If I want to take my coin out, we say, the distance of Edinburgh, it will then re represent one hundredth of a second of arc. And to get one thousandth of a second of arc, then I must take it and put it way over in New York. And that's the kind of quantity we are dealing with in astronomy. But those proper motions can be detected. And you know, the very first man who realized that 
was in fact Edmund Halley, who wasn't concerned only with comets by a long way. He compared the positions of some bright stars in his day with those as they were measured by the Greek astronomer Hipparchus more than 2,000 years earlier. And the, please remember that name, Hipparchus, we'll come back to just a minute or two. And Halley found that three bright stars, one of which was Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, had shifted appreciably in position against the background of more remote stars. And that was very evident with Sirius, which has an exceptionally large proper motion. But even so, it takes a long time to crawl across the sky relative to the more distant stars by a distance equal to the apparent diameter of the full moon. In fact, it takes 1,350 years, and that is pretty slow going. But even so, there are not very many stars with proper motions greater than that of Sirius. And the distance of Sirius is only eight and a half light years, and there aren't very many stars closer than that. A light year, incidentally, is the distance travelled by a ray of light in one year, not very far short of six million million miles. And that is the unit we normally use to measure star distances, because the mile or the kilometre would be inconveniently short and clumsy. I mean, just imagine measuring the distance between London and Moscow in inches. It would take a long, large number of figures. So that's what we do. On the other hand, we know that the stars are immensely remote. There are very few stars closer than Sirius, and the closest star beyond the Sun is a member of the southern Alpha Centauri system at over four light years. So how do we go about measuring these distances? What is the procedure? Well, it defeated all astronomers right up to the 19th century, and the problem was finally solved in 1838 by a German astronomer whose name was Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel. And he concentrated upon a rather faint naked eye star in the constellation of the Swan. It's known as 61 Cygni, and is not very far away from the brilliant star Deneb. You can just about see it with the naked eye. Now, for various reasons, which we needn't go into just at the moment, Bessel thought that 61 Cygni might be exceptionally close by stellar standards, and therefore it was a good one upon which to concentrate. And his method was that of parallax. Now, to show what parallax means, May I ask you to take part with me in a very simple experiment? First of all, close one eye. Now hold up your finger and align it with my nose in the television screen. Now, without moving anything, use the other eye. And you will see that your finger is no longer aligned with my nose. And the reason for that is you're looking at it from a slightly different direction. Your two eyes are not in the same place. And the distance between one eye and the other, for this purpose, is known as the baseline. And by knowing the angular shift of your finger, which you can measure, and by knowing the baseline, you can solve the entire triangle and work out how far away your finger is from your face. And that is the basic method of parallax. But of course, the greater the distance of your target object, the longer the baseline you need. And this really is what surveyors do if they want to measure the distance of some inaccessible object, such as um, a church spire on the far side of a river. What your surveyor does is to have a longer baseline, maybe a few hundred yards, it may even be a mile or two, and then simply measure the church spire from first one and then the other, and you will get your angles. Then again, you can solve the triangle, and you get the distance of the church spire. But of course, even that won't do for the stars, because you need a very much longer baseline. And Bessel decided to use nothing more nor less than the diameter of the Earth's orbit. Now, the Earth is 93 million miles from the Sun, and therefore, in a period of six months, moving from one side to the other, it will travel a distance of 186 million miles. And that gives a long enough baseline. So he observed 61 Cygni in the six monthly intervals and saw that it shifted very slightly against the background of more distant stars. What he was measuring was the actual shift in angular seconds of arc, and that's called the parallax, and from that he could work out the distance of 61 Cygni, which he got more or less right. It's about 11 light years away, and there are very few stars closer than that, though of course Sirius happens to be one. So that, in fact, is the method used, and it's um, very accurate out to a certain limit of distance. But in the sky, we have to deal with the apparent and the actual movements of stars, and that really is a combination of the star's proper motion and also its parallax. And that gives a kind of a wave form. So let's go back again to Sirius, one of the closest stars in the sky, and see just how it behaves over a period of two years. And we're measuring here in arc seconds. We've got both the parallax and the proper motion, and that gives a kind of a wave, and the time interval there between successive waves is one year.
But of course, we are all the time dealing with very, very small distances, fractions of a second of arc. And there is a limit to what you can do from the Earth's surface with our prison equipment. We want to do better. And that is the purpose of an exciting new satellite to be called Hipparchos, which is now being planned. And at this stage, I'm delighted to welcome back Andrew Murray of the Royal Greenwich Observatory, who's been very closely concerned with Hipparchos from the outset. First of all, Andrew, why Hipparchos? Well, Hipparchos is the acronym High Precision Parallax Collecting Satellite, which is being organized by the European Space Agency. And the idea is to map 120,000 stars in position and proper motion and parallax in a mission lasting two and a half years. What's the purpose of collecting this information? Well, we need to know the distances of the stars. Um, distance is one of the most fundamental problems in astronomy. And from the ground, as you say, we're very limited in what we can measure. How far can you go? Well, uh, a few tens of light years. For instance, if we take uh, stars within 50 light years, we can be fairly sure um, that we know their distances fairly accurately. Now, we can observe not only their uh, distances, but also their colors. And by having their distance, we can get their absolute brightness. And if we plot the absolute brightness against the color, we have what is known as a color magnitude diagram. In this diagram you see on your screen, the shaded area towards the right-hand side represents the area in which most of the stars within 50 light years will lie. The fainter stars are at the bottom and the brighter stars are at the top. Well, what happens if you go further up than that, well, 150 light years or so? It becomes rather more exciting. Um, at 150 or 200 light years, we get a picture which now extends from the bottom right-hand bottom right corner nearly to the top left. This is known as the main sequence, and these are stars burning hydrogen, and they are no known as dwarf stars, and our sun is a dwarf star indicated on the screen. We also get uh, uh, stars on the right-hand side, redder stars. These are stars that have started burning helium, and they are giant stars. They've swollen up, they're getting quite large, and they're getting cooler, and therefore they are um, in the red part of the diagram. And by the Hipparchus mission, we will be able to measure directly the distances to these hotter stars and these redder giant stars. What exactly is the method that Hipparchus is going to use? Well, the method is essentially like a surveyor uses on the surface of the Earth to measure distances. The satellite is two fields of view, here and here, looking at two parts of the sky, 58 degrees apart, and it spins slowly in such a way that the particular part of the sky is seen first of all in one field, the preceding field, and then 20 minutes later, the following field. And by scanning the sky in a great circle, we can measure up the distances of the stars along a great circle scan. And as you see on your screen, the scan circle gradually drifts during the mission so that over the whole mission, we build up a pattern of intersecting circles over the whole sky. The actual measurements are done by a kind of a grid system, are they not? Yes. In the common focal plane of the two fields of view, there's a finely ruled grid of rather less than 3,000 lines. And as a star crosses the grid, so it lights, dims, and uh, comes out again, and you see the bottom there, what we call the light curve, and the position of the star on the grid is given by the phase of the light signal measured against time. Now, we can measure the angular distance between two stars, say, one in one field of view and one in the other, by looking at the difference of phase of the two light signals. On your screen, for instance, the, the white one would be the preceding field of view, and the yellow one, say, the, right, the following field of view. The stars come in slightly later. Time is the horizontal axis, and the angular distance between the two stars is given by the 58 degrees of the basic angle separating the two fields, plus the difference of phase between the two light signals. Will Hipparchus cover the entire sky? Yes, the scanning law is such that it covers every point in the sky many times during the mission at different, different days and different months during two and a half years, so that any particular point is covered many times. Well, let's just consider one particular point, shall we? Let's go for the lovely star cluster of the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, mainly because it's now so very nicely visible in the evening sky after sunset. Quite easy to find. Start again with Orion. There it is, with the red supergiant Betelgeuse and the brilliant white Rigel. 
Follow the line of the stars downwards, the belt stars, and you'll come to Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. We've talked about that. Follow the line of the belt upwards, and you'll come first of all to Aldebaran, the red eye of the bull. And then, following on, you come to the Pleiades. And when you first look at them, they appear as a kind of hazy patch in the sky. But look more carefully, and you will see individual stars. I remember that many years ago, about 30 years ago, I think, we actually carried out a sky at night experiment and asked viewers to collaborate. And we found out then that the average person can see seven individual stars in the Pleiades with the naked eye on a fairly good night. But of course, binoculars show many more, and with a telescope, you can see hundreds. And we now know that the distance of the Pleiades cluster is rather more than 400 light years. And of course, the Pleiades are going to be targets for Hipparchus, are they not? Certainly. And the area around the Pleiades will be covered by between 20 and 30 scans at different times during the mission. As you see on your screen, the scans come from many different directions in the sky so that we will measure the relative positions and the relative motions of the stars in the Pleiades area, their parallaxes and their proper motions relative to stars all over the sky. Well, that certainly gives Hipparchus a very full program, but what else will it do? Are there other experiments too? Well, I have concentrated on the um, uh, parallax measurements, but Hipparchus will also provide a very coherent map of star positions and proper motions. Uh, from the ground, the accuracy with which we can get these is limited by the fact that any single observatory cannot observe the whole sky, so we have to tie together the uh, measurements made in different parts of the Earth, and this causes difficulties with uh, the atmosphere and instrumental distortions and so on. So with Hipparchus, we will build up this very accurate, homogeneous map of the sky, and the target accuracy on the average is about two thousandth of an arc second in the position, proper motion, and parallax. That's the distance of Moscow in your Mickey Mouse money. And then, of course, there's the Tycho experiment. Tycho is an additional experiment on the satellite. Uh, it doesn't produce as accurate results as Hipparchus, but it will be a complete survey of positions, magnitudes, and colors of stars down to the 10th magnitude. And this is carried out in parallel with Hipparchus. And how are the general preparations going? Very well indeed. The satellite is nearly complete. It's been uh, constructed under the auspices of the Space Agency. It was on schedule to be launched in July 1988, but unfortunately with the mm. mishaps to the Ariane rocket, this has now been put back till April 1989, which we hope will be the date of launch. And after that, there's the two and a half years mission, uh, takes us through to 1992, and then we have another two or three years during which the data has to be analyzed and the positions, motions, and parallax have to be calculated, and the final catalog will be available for all astronomers, perhaps, say, by the year 1995. Well, it seems to be going well. Andrew, are you confident of success? Yes. I'm delighted to hear it. And, of course, this is really a very much of a long-term project, isn't it? Yes, it's for the benefit of all astronomers. It's not just a few uh, experimenters, as on some space projects. This is for the whole of astronomy and provides a database that will be used for this generation and the next. Well, it certainly is a really exciting project, and I think it's going to yield very, very fruitful results. Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. So you see, Hipparchus appears to be going well. We're going to hear a great deal more about it in the coming years. And don't forget also, as Andrew has said, this is not only an experiment of value for astronomers of today, but the maps and the data produced by the Hipparchus satellite are going to be of utmost value to astronomers for literally centuries ahead. Good night. That edition of The Sky at Night will be shown again next Saturday afternoon on BBC Two at five past twelve.